Dark Rest, a Lance Brody story. Written by Michael Robertson Jr. Narrated by Michael Robertson Jr. 1. I have to pee. Leah shifted in the Beatles driver's seat and looked over to Lance, who had the passenger seat reclined and pushed back to give his long legs comfortable space. Out the windshield, the highway stretched far ahead of them in the blackness of night, and the Beatles' headlights were doing their best to cut weak cones of light through the dark. Few other cars were present, not in their northbound lane nor the opposing southbound route that was just visible in quick glimpses over the raised mound of earth that served as the median. It was two o'clock in the morning. Lance, who felt as though he'd been traveling alone for so long, was both immensely enjoying and also learning how to travel with a companion. Not just any companion, mind you, but Leah. The person who, just like the headlights that were working to guide their way through the dark unknown, was responsible for shining her own rays of sunshine into Lance's mind, body, and spirit when he needed it the most. She'd warmed him from the inside out at a time when it felt like coldness was the only feeling he'd ever know again. He knew the age-old jokes about traveling with women, how they'd have to stop to pee every half hour. But, truth was, he'd had four cups of coffee and a glass of ice water when they'd stopped for dinner at the big truck stop diner a little over an hour ago, and he was about to burst. Me too, he said, and sat up in his seat, looking out the windshield in search of a highway exit sign that would notify them of possible locales to do what was needed. A mile later, one such sign presented itself, advertising a 24-hour fast food joint and also a variety of gas stations that might offer a restroom. The exit was two miles away. Thank God, Leah said. I shouldn't have had all that tea at dinner. She looked over to Lance and grinned. I don't know how you aren't just hooked up to a catheter at this point, all that coffee you drink. Lance smiled, was in fact ready to make a witty retort. But then another highway sign emerged from the darkness as the Beatles' headlights did their job. This one advertised a highway rest stop. It was five miles away. Lance stared at the sign as they passed it. There was a small tingling at the base of his skull. Or was there? It had been very faint. Might have just been some air blowing across his neck. A draft from one of the Beatles' old windows. Could have just been a chill. It was very late and he was tired and they'd been driving for most of the day, so it was completely plausible that he'd imagined the whole thing. Ahead, the exit ramp that promised the fast food and gas stations appeared and Leah slowed the car and flicked on the turn signal. A hundred yards from the exit, Lance said, No. Keep going. Let's use the rest stop instead. Leah must have heard something in his voice, because she simply nodded and switched off the turn signal, increased her speed, and drove on ahead. 2. In the daytime, the biggest threats one might imagine from a highway rest stop would be unsanitary conditions or the potential for stepping in dog poop somebody failed to pick up and dispose of properly when they let little Fido out for a much-needed break, or having one of the vending machines eat your change and fail to deliver the candy bar or pack of crackers. In the sunlight, highway rest stops were well-trafficked, a constant flow of cars coming in and out as families and business folk and truck drivers all congregated to stretch their legs and answer nature's call. They'd sit at the picnic tables and breathe in some fresh air and eat their packed lunches or snacks, if the vending machine did in fact cooperate, and they'd all exist together with silent smiles while really never seeing one another, each person or group existing only within themselves, the same way it was when they went to the grocery store or to the movies and even the dreaded Department of Motor Vehicles. They saw other people, but they didn't really see them. Didn't need to. Humans have become incredibly adept at putting the blinders on to anything except their own life, their own tasks. But at night, when the sun settles and the darkness begins to swallow things, highway rest stops suddenly take on a different persona. Instead of bright and airy places meant to offer a short reprieve from a slog of a drive, they suddenly grow ominous, almost desolate. They become outcroppings on the wasteland that unfolds beyond the threshold of civilization. Orange-tinted lamps light the parking area, creating an artificial haze that makes you feel as though you're driving into an old Spielberg film. Unlike the daytime, when the place is busy and full of movement, now each car, and there are only a few, parked in the lot suddenly must have its own story, must have a reason as to why it's here at such an hour, here with you. Their drivers become mysteries you want to solve, need to solve. 
Because the what if begins to set in. What if they're a drug addict, tweaked up and out of their mind? What if they're a rapist, waiting for an unsuspecting victim? What if they're a murderer, some serial killer that the authorities have been trying to capture for months, maybe years, but is too clever for them, always one step ahead, and tonight is the night they kill again? What if? You start to wonder who could be lurking in the shadows of the small alcove where the vending machines hum their song, or who might be waiting behind a closed stall door. Has the state installed security cameras here? Why aren't the lights brighter at the bathroom entrances? So many things are completely innocent in the daylight, but at night, the night changes everything. 3. Leah again slowed the Beatles' speed and flicked on the turn signal and started to take the short off-ramp into the rest stop's parking lot. Lance saw her glance at him from the corner of his eye, and he knew that she was waiting for some sort of explanation as to why he'd decided to pass up the restroom options that now lay a few miles behind them and had instead opted for the rest stop. He didn't have a good answer, so Lance said nothing. The parking lot looked incredibly large being as empty as it was, just a sea of black tops sporadically lit by overhead lamps positioned every 15 parking spots or so. The buildings, there were three in total, sat off to the right of the lot, a cement pathway led from the sidewalk that ran parallel to the parking lot and snaked in an artistically twisted path to the main building, which housed the restrooms, and to a smaller structure to the left that was three walls and an archway that led into an alcove full of vending machines. The third building sat further back and to the right of the main building, a smaller square unit that must have been a utility and maintenance shed, probably full of pumps and switches and gauges and tools, maybe a mower for when the weather was warmer and the grass needed cutting. Unlike the other two buildings, which were made up with brick and stone and meant to be appealing to the eye, the utility shed was all metal and steel with no windows. For some reason, it reminded Lance of a futuristic prison cell. There was no cement pathway leading to the shed. Instead, there was a thin, crushed gravel path that almost seemed like an afterthought. Lance took this all in as Leah parked the beetle in a space slightly to the right of the main building, placing Lance directly in line with the shed. There were three other cars in the lot. A small, dark-colored sedan had been parked horizontally across three parking spaces just past where the off-ramp had ended. A white t-shirt was draped out of the passenger side window, a flag of surrender from the car's engine. No driver. Whether the car had broken down an hour ago or a week ago, there was no way to tell. Parked further down, near the vending machine alcove, there was an SUV. A huge, boxy, tank-on-wheels type of thing that looked more suited for an off-road excursion than chewing up highway miles. The third vehicle was parked facing the highway in a row of spaces behind and opposite the SUV, and it got Leah very excited. Oh shit, that's a Tesla, Leah said, looking over her shoulder and out the window once they'd parked. I've never seen one in person. Lance followed her gaze to the car, saw a sleek and sporty-looking sedan. He said, Tesla? Like Nikola? Like the inventor? Leah didn't turn away from the car to look at him, but he could hear the wide eyes in her voice. You don't know about Tesla, the car company? They make all electric cars that are super safe and have all kinds of tech in them, and, well, they're also completely badass. Lance nodded. I usually ride the bus. Now Leah did turn to look at him, that lovely smile of hers shining bright in the darkened cabin of the car. Not anymore, you don't, she said, and leaned across the seat and kissed him. He kissed her back, the two of them staying that way until the scream pierced the silence, shattered the moment. 4. Lance and Leah's head snapped apart, a kiss cut short by the cry that had just erupted in the night. Leah turned quickly in her seat, and Lance's eyes darted out the windshield toward the direction the sound seemed to have traveled from. A small boy, no more than five or six, was standing alone just outside the entrance to the restrooms. He wore pajama pants and a puffy winter jacket. He was jumping up and down and pointing to the ground where a row of small bushes lined the front of the building. His face was that of abject terror. Lance watched as the boy grew stone still, as if suddenly petrified. Then the boy leaned down slowly, peering more closely at something on the ground before he bolted upright again and echoed the same high-pitched wail of a scream as before. Lance and Leah moved in tandem, the Beatles' doors flying open. Their footsteps pounded on the sidewalk. 
Leah's ponytail whipped behind her as Lance followed for a few feet before overtaking her with his longer strides. The cold night air was like water splashed on his face. It filled his lungs and awakened his senses. He ignored the weaving concrete path and cut the corner through the grass, maybe 40 yards away now, just a matter of seconds. But before he could make it to the boy, a huge hulking figure shot from the entrance to the bathrooms and snatched the boy off the ground. Lance felt fear grip him for just a second. Not fear for himself, but for the boy. Fear as to what was about to happen to him, and if Lance could get there in time to stop it. What? What's wrong, honey? The hulking figure had a voice, deep and strong, but oddly full of concern and affection. Lance slowed his pace, and Leah nearly collided into him. From this angle, closer to the light, Lance saw that the hulking figure was nothing more than a very tall and very broad-shouldered man. He wore sweatpants and a similar puffy jacket to that of the boys. He was clean-shaven and wore his hair buzzed. Why did you scream? the man asked. Tell Daddy why you screamed. And then the man's eyes looked up and away from his sons and scanned the area and landed on Lance and Leah. Lance did what he always did in awkward situations like this. He threw on one of his patented awkward smiles, one that hopefully said, We were only trying to help. We were not the reason he screamed. Scout's honor. Lance couldn't tell what was happening inside the big man's head. But if the man had been considering whether Lance and Leah had possibly been the threat that had caused his son to cry out, the boy quickly set the matter straight. Snake, the kid yelled, pointing down to the ground again by the row of bushes. I saw a snake. The boy's father looked down to where his son was pointing, apparently saw nothing, and then gave Lance and Leah another stare across the expanse of grass that separated them before he nodded once and said, Your mom was right. I should have never let you watch that movie. It's fine. I've got you now. Let's get back on the road, okay? The boy said nothing, and as the big man carried him back to the tank-like SUV, Lance heard the man assure him, You know, snakes are more afraid of us than we are of them. You don't have to be afraid. Lance didn't know if this was true. Last he checked, humans didn't have fangs that could literally drip poison. But that debate wasn't important right now. For now, he still had to pee. The man and boy drove away in their enormous vehicle, merging effortlessly into the empty highway. From beside Lance, Leah said, Well, that was more excitement than I was expecting. I'm wide awake now. My kiss woke you up? Leah smacked him on the butt and walked toward the restrooms. Sure. Lance smiled and followed, glancing over his shoulder as he walked, looking back to the Tesla and remembering the tingling that he may or may not have had at the base of his skull. 5. The building with the restrooms had a solid stone front with openings on the far left and right sides, like a face with two empty eye sockets. Lance watched as Leah was first bathed in the yellow light of the lamp mounted above the entrance and then vanished into the women's room on the left. Lance stood outside the building for another 30 seconds, a slight breeze dancing through his hair, giving him a chill. He looked across the parking lot from the Tesla and then down toward the entrance where the sedan was broken down, and then all the way across again to the opposite side where the building with the vending machines waited. He saw all of this, but he also saw nothing. Nothing unusual, anyway. But Lance knew better than most that unusual didn't always present itself at face value. He stepped inside the men's room, swallowed by the light. The fluorescents here were harsh, a brutal assault of artificial light, Lance squinted against their blast and let his eyes adjust. The restroom was thankfully not disgusting. In fact, it was quite clean. The room was mostly free of dirt and smudges and other stuff, and there was a hint of lemon-scented cleaner in the air. To his right, there were six urinals and six stalls, with an equal number of sinks on the left, an equal number of mirrors mounted above each sink. There was a baby changing station mounted on the wall just before the sinks, along with two automatic paper towel dispensers. A trash can was recessed into the wall near the doorway. All these things were normal, exactly what you'd expect in a restroom. But Lance wasn't paying attention to these things. Not really. His eyes were drawn to the back of the room, a door directly opposite him standing maybe a quarter of the way open. The same terrible fluorescent light escaped from the gap between the door and its frame. Hello? Lance tried, a little louder than he meant. Anybody in here? He felt silly as soon as the words left his mouth. There was still the Tesla in the parking lot, so there very well could be somebody in the restroom with him. 
And how would he feel if at 2 o'clock in the morning, while he was trying to handle his business in a highway restroom stall, somebody just came in and started shouting questions? But there were no patrons at the urinals, and he hadn't heard any signs of life from the stalls. So it stood the reason that if somebody was in here with him, they must be behind door number one. Tell them what they've won, Johnny. Today they'll be going home with a brand new psychopath, knives and guns included. Lance took one step toward the door at the back of the room when the sound of a powerful engine fed through the restroom's open entryway and reverberated off the walls. Whatever it was, it was moving fast, getting closer. Tires screeched, the engine ceased its rumble, and a door was opened and closed. He couldn't say why, but Lance didn't like any of it. He glanced longingly at the urinals, his bladder protesting, and said, Until we meet again. Then he hurried out the doorway and into the night. 6. There were two reasons why Leah had bolted from the beetle with Lance when the boy had screamed. First, when a young child screams in fear and you don't see a parent or other adult around, you help. That's just a page out of Being Human 101. The second reason was this was her life now. She was a partner to a man who had gifts and abilities and intuitions well beyond any person she'd ever met or was likely to ever meet in the future, and his gifts were only outshined by the size of his heart. Leah had made the decision to leave home just a few short days ago and had come to join Lance so that they could be together, both as a couple, because boy did she love him, and as a team of light against the darkness. She knew the risks. Risks that she also knew Lance was still struggling with accepting at some deep down level, but she'd made her choice. So the boy had screamed and she and Lance had taken off, on the move to help. Turns out it had been nothing. Just a child who might have seen a snake and gotten scared. His father had come running, as any good father should, and then everything was right in the world again. But not really. She heard the way Lance had told her to pass the exit ramp for the gas stations and restaurant, to keep driving to the rest stop. He'd not given her a reason, and she'd not asked, but she'd heard the tone all the same. A feeling. He'd had a feeling. That had to be it. Leah was trying to learn so much about who Lance was, how he operated in a world in which he was such an outlier, using senses and feelings in ways that others could not. She wasn't certain she'd ever fully understand any of it. Wasn't sure it was even possible for somebody without his gifts to understand. But she'd do her best. For the rest of her life, she'd do her best. So she'd driven here, not knowing what to expect, and if the young boy hadn't been the reason for the skipped exit, then what was? Leah entered the restroom and was pleased to see that the facility was cleaner than she'd expected. She stopped to take in her surroundings, which was something she'd been doing long before Lance Brody had ever come into her life. When you had a father who taught you how to handle a shotgun before you could consistently tie your shoes, and you'd then suffer through the disappearance of a sibling who had ended up being murdered, you learned to be cautious and hardened, not ignorant to the idea of threats, blinded by a sense of immortality as so many young people tend to be. Leah instantly recognized the fact that she was not alone in the women's restroom. Audible over the low hum of the fluorescence above, she heard the slight shuffling of sneakers on the tiled floor, a gentle creak of weight shifting on a toilet seat. Then there was a sound like the jangling of keys that was quickly silenced, as if them announcing themselves had been accidental. Leah waited, leaned down and saw a pair of sneaker-clad feet in the last stall, all the way at the end, just before the door to what must have been a janitor's closet. The door was open only the slightest bit. She took a few steps closer, cleared her throat just to make sure that her presence would be known to whoever sat in the last stall. She didn't want it to appear that she was trying to sneak up on anybody. Leah entered the middle stall and did what she'd come to do, her ears alert and waiting to see if she could pick up anything else from the person at the end of the row. Hearing nothing and feeling much better, Leah left the stall and went to a sink, washed her hands thoroughly and used the mirror to keep her eyes on the pair of sneakers behind her. They did not move, seemed rooted in place. Something tugged at Leah, something in her gut that told her maybe the person in the last stall was the reason Lance had told her to pass the exit, to come here. Because the more Leah watched the pair of sneakers in the mirror and the more she thought about everything she'd seen and heard since she'd entered the restroom, the more she thought the person in the stall might be trying to keep themselves hidden. Outside, the sound of a fast approaching engine suddenly echoed off the restroom's walls. The person in the stall let out a tiny gasp. Leah turned and took a step toward the stall, stopped a few feet from it. 
Are you okay? She asked. Do you need help? The person inside said nothing. I'm here with my boyfriend, Leah pressed on. Can we do anything for you? Nothing. Just the sound of someone trying to keep their breathing under control from the other side of the stall door. Leah waited another beat, then heard the soft screech of tires on asphalt, followed by a car door opening and closing. 7. Lance stepped out of the men's room and saw a pickup truck parked diagonally across two spots next to the Tesla. The truck shined in the moonlight, sparkling paint from a recent wash and glinting chrome and tires black as the night. It was modest in size, as modest as trucks could be these days. The SUV the little boy and his father had driven away in had been both taller and wider, but it looked new and expensive, something from a luxury line. A man, presumably the truck's driver, was leaning down and looking through the Tesla's driver's side window. He wore jeans and a button-down shirt, no jacket. He was average height and appeared to be maybe in his 30s, though it was difficult to tell from Lance's vantage point. For just a moment, Lance thought maybe the man was simply a fan of the brand, much like Leah had been. But then the man did something that quickly squashed this theory. He reached down and opened the sedan's door, which caused Lance to wonder why somebody who drove such a presumably expensive vehicle would risk leaving it unlocked in a parking lot. The car's interior dome light switched on, and even from here it was apparent to Lance that the vehicle was empty, unless somebody was laying down across the back seat. The man, apparently coming to the same conclusion, cursed loud enough for Lance to hear and then slammed the door closed. When the man's head darted up and he stared in the direction of the restrooms, Lance took a small step backward, half concealing himself behind the wall of the men's room doorway, positioning himself to a point where he was fairly certain he could not be seen, but he could still see out. Lance hadn't liked the way the man's head had snapped toward the building, like a hunter that had suddenly picked up on the scent of his prey. The man started moving fast, his walk quickening until it reached a casual jog, his head on a swivel as he crossed the parking lot and then bounded up onto the sidewalk and through the grass as if searching for somebody. Whether because he was trying to find them or making sure he wasn't being watched, Lance wasn't sure. He thought it might be a little bit of both. When the man reached the cement walkway in front of the building, Lance's heart suddenly kicked up in his chest, his hackles raised. Because when the man reached the restrooms, just as Lance was about to step further inside the men's room and pretend to be just finished washing his hands, as to not indicate that he'd been spying on the man, the man made a left turn instead of a right, headed straight for the women's room. Leah. The signs fixed to the wall and above the doorway of each restroom very clearly indicated which was which, and when you coupled this with the strange behavior Lance had already observed, it was very clear the man had intentions other than relieving himself. Lance sprang from the open to men's room doorway. Hey! The man jerked to a stop, spun around fast. He stood in place, but Lance saw the man's fist tighten, flex hard enough to see the whites of his knuckles before he eventually relaxed them. What? The man's eyes bore holes into Lance. Up close, Lance could see his initial observation had been correct. The guy was early thirties, had a day's worth of stubble and bright white teeth that showed as he spat the word. The jeans and shirt were crisp and looked pricey. He wore leather shoes that looked like they might have had a four-figure price tag. And beneath that pricey wardrobe, there was an anger seething. It was as visible as the shining paint on the man's truck and the white enamel of his teeth. That's the women's room, Lance said, taking a small step forward, standing up tall. He had six or seven inches on the guy. The man's fist flexed again, and Lance actually heard the knuckles crack this time. The guy was shorter but he looked wound up, full of energy. His shirt fabric was snug against muscles beneath. Gym muscles, Lance thought. Built for looks, not function. But they would still make for a hard hit, should it come to that. I know, the man said. They stared at each other, each man standing in the cone of light from the lamps overhead of each doorway, like actors in a stage play, on their mark and ready to begin. Out on the highway, an 18-wheeler roared by, Neither man turned to look, not wanting to risk taking their eyes off each other. Are you a woman? Lance asked. The absurdity of the question rattled something inside the man, and he suddenly looked offended. The fuck did you just say to me? The fist flexed again. Lance stood his ground, stayed calm. He had dealt with far worse than hot-headed prep boys. He didn't want to fight the guy, and had no idea what was actually happening right now. 
but he did know that Leah was inside the women's room, and he didn't want this guy near her. I asked if you were a woman, Lance said. He held up his hands. No judgment. I'm very progressive, trust me. But if you're not a woman, I don't see what reason you have to be going into the women's restroom. Lance took a step to the left, revealing the open doorway to the men's room behind him. The men's room is very clean, if that's what you're worried about. I admit I was skeptical myself when I arrived, but somebody does a good job with this place's upkeep. I'm not saying I eat off the floor or anything, but... He shrugged. Lance was rambling. Though he was naturally very quiet, he had the gift of gab when it was necessary. He was stalling, trying to keep the man occupied long enough for... Leah stepped out of the women's room doorway. 8. Leah had positioned herself to where she could peer out of the women's room and watch as a man had jumped out of the driver's side of a newly arrived pickup truck and then examined the Tesla. When he opened the driver's door, she crinkled her brow in confusion. She'd only skimmed the surface of her fascination with Elon Musk and Tesla when she'd explained to Lance what the car was. She'd done lots of reading and research on the brand, had watched countless YouTube videos of Tesla owners showing off their cars and testing different features and situations. It was a bit of a guilty pleasure for her. So she knew that this particular Tesla was a Model S, and that by default, when the driver walked away from the vehicle carrying the key fob, the car would lock itself when the fob left a certain proximity, which meant that the key fob was either inside the car still, or the man had a fob on him. She studied the man's attire, then gave the pickup truck a once-over. It all looked expensive. He was apparently somebody who liked nice things. It would make sense that the Tesla was his, but then why was it here? abandoned at two in the morning. Leah strained to try to look into the passenger side window of the truck. Saw nobody. Which meant the man wasn't here to retrieve the Tesla unless he planned on leaving the truck. Which she doubted, considering how haphazardly it had been parked. She was processing all of this when panic suddenly seized her as she realized that the man was now moving quickly in her direction. She took two quick steps backward, concealing herself inside the restroom. His footsteps were coming hard and fast, only a few feet away from the women's room doorway now. Had he seen her? She wasn't sure. Probably not. It was too dark outside the building, not bright and blinding like the fluorescence inside. She turned and looked behind her, back to the last stall, saw the sneakers pull themselves up and out of view, a clear yet pointless attempt at hiding. And that confirmed it. Whoever was in the stall did not want to be found. The footsteps echoed off the bathroom's walls now, closer than seemed possible without the man actually being inside with her. Leah spun and looked for anything that might be used as a weapon to defend herself, not really knowing why, other than knowing that Lance had brought them here for a reason, and that she doubted very much that if the man from the pickup truck had had to use the bathroom badly enough to move as fast as he was moving now, that he would have taken the time to stop and investigate the Tesla. She had nothing around her but paper towel dispensers and a trash can built into the wall, she looked to the back wall, saw the partially open door. There might be something back there, something she could use. Or maybe she could hide, try to make herself invisible like the person in the last stall. No, that wasn't her style. She took in a deep breath and tightened her core and was ready for, well, anything really, when she heard Lance shout, Hey! The footsteps stopped. Leah let out a breath she'd been holding listened as the two men had an exchange in which Lance had asked if the man was a woman, which caused Leah to roll her eyes and have to stifle a chuckle by clasping her hands over her mouth. But the man had not laughed. Instead, his voice had grown full of malice. When Lance started rambling about the restroom's cleanliness, Leah understood what was happening. He was stalling for her, waiting for her to emerge so they could handle this together. She stepped out of the women's room doorway and could only go a couple feet because the man was blocking her path. His back turned to her. Excuse me, sir, Leah said, trying to sound friendlier and peppier than anybody had any right to sound to in the morning. The man spun around and Leah saw more than anger in his eyes. She saw violence. She'd seen the same look on her own father's face in those times when he'd had a bit too much to drink when she and Samuel had been younger and, well, it had never ended pleasantly. She kept her smile in place, but her heart started pounding harder in her chest. The man must have realized that he was scaring her. Whether he would have been as concerned about her well-being had Lance not been standing behind him, Leah doubted very much, but for now the man seemed to sense that his actions were causing concern and likely would do him no good in accomplishing whatever he set out to do. 
Leah watched as Lance took a step closer when the man had turned to face her. She risked a quick glance in his direction, hoping he'd get the message to stand down. She had this. For now. The man's voice suddenly grew soft and docile, almost pleading. I'm sorry. He turned so he was facing the parking lot, took a step back so that he could speak to both of them. I might have started us off on the wrong foot. I'm... He paused, and to Leah it looked as if he were trying to summon some tears in an effort to seem more dramatic. In the end, he just gave a pathetic-sounding sigh and squinted his eyes briefly as if they stung. I'm trying to find my sister. She's missing. Leah's bullshit detector sounded all kinds of alarms in her head. She didn't need any of Lance's gift to realize the guy was lying. His act was almost comical it was so bad. The man hung his head down and stared at the ground, trying to milk his somber performance. Leah took the opportunity to look to Lance. She quickly jerked her head back toward the women's room and nodded. I think she's in there. Missing for how long, Lance asked. The man shrugged. A day or so. Or so, Lance asked. The man said nothing, shrugged again. What's her name, Lance asked. Allison. How old is Allison? Leah asked. She thought she knew what Lance was doing. Uh, the man started. Bingo. Twenty. Sorry, the man said. I always have to stop and do the math. Lance cleared his throat and said, If she's twenty and has only been gone for a day or so, like you said, how do you know she's missing and not just off on her own, living her best life, as the kids say? I mean, I think they say that, right? The man didn't like this. He stood straight again and there was a renewed anger in his eyes. The false sadness vanished in an instant. Are you making light of my situation? He asked Lance. Lance shook his head. Not in the slightest, he said, and his voice carried its own bravado, letting the man know that they both knew there was more to whatever was happening than the man was letting on. Leah watched as Lance held the man's stare for a beat before he looked past the man's shoulder and said to her, Leah, is there a girl in the restroom who might be 20 years old? Not that I saw, which wasn't a lie, not really. She'd not actually seen the person that had been in the stall at the end of the row, so she'd have no way of knowing how old said person might be. The man looked from Leah to Lance, then back to Leah. He mustn't have liked what he saw. I think I'll just check for myself, if you don't mind. He turned toward Leah and tried to push his way into the women's room. Leah stood her ground, meaning to block the way, but the guy was too strong and he essentially hip-checked her into the side of the doorway. Leah saw a flash of movement, and just as the man was about to place a foot over the threshold, Lance grabbed him by the shoulder and spun him around, hard. The man grunted in frustration and anger and swung a wide-arcing punch toward the side of Lance's face. It was slow and clumsy and totally expected, and Lance used his free hand to block the blow and then latch on to the man's wrist, clamping down tight. The men froze, tangled in each other's grip, the action over as quickly as it had started. The moment lasted a second or two longer than Leah thought it should have, and she thought she saw something odd quickly work its way across Lance's face, almost like a grimace of pain, but not quite. Then Lance smiled as though the two men were simply playing some sort of sport and the match was over. Leah, he said, again looking over the man's shoulder as he gently released his grip on the man's wrist, can you do our pal here a favor and double check? Just pop inside and make sure his sister's not in there? Leah let her eyes slide from Lance's to the man's. Then she smiled big and said, Sure, happy to do it. Just a sec. We'll wait, Lance said. Right? The man's eyes were murderous, but he somehow restrained himself. He did not speak, but he nodded. Leah stepped back into the women's room and took a breath, refocused. She walked straight to the end of the row of stalls, prepared to let whoever was in there, Allison or otherwise, know what was happening and maybe get some understanding as to who the guy outside really was. She stopped. The stall door was ajar and inside was empty. Leah looked to her left, saw the door at the far wall still open just a bit. She walked over quickly and peered inside, whispering, Hey, are you in there? She nudged the door open a bit more with her foot and looked inside, saw nothing but a small janitor's closet full of supplies. There was nobody in the restroom. Leah walked back outside and said, She's not in there. It's completely empty and she didn't understand how that was possible. 9. She's not in there. 
It's completely empty. Lance watched as Leah came out of the women's room and relayed her message, and it was obvious she was telling the truth, because he thought she looked somewhat confused. She'd indicated to him earlier that there was in fact a girl in the restroom, perhaps the very girl that this man was looking for, and now it seemed that there wasn't. Interesting, but not what Lance was immediately concerned about. If the girl really was gone, then that was good, because the man standing between Lance and Leah was a very bad dude. Lance forced on his smile and slipped on his pleasant voice and said, Well, there you have it. Nobody inside. The man took a deep breath, as if trying to control his emotions, which Lance now knew he usually had a very difficult time doing. I don't suppose you'd be so kind as to let me check the men's room, see if she's in there. Lance cleared his throat, spoke loudly, just in case somebody else that wasn't standing here, somebody hiding, perhaps, needed to hear. Let me get this straight, just for my own understanding. You, you don't have to understand, the man growled softly. His frustration was clearly growing. Sure I do. I'm involved now. You're not. This has nothing to do with you. Lance shrugged. Maybe not at first, but now that you've physically assaulted my girlfriend, I'd say I'm very much involved, and perhaps being much nicer than I should be. But I guess that's just my nature. I like the help like to try and see the good in people. So, if you would please, humor me. The man crossed his arms, eyes like slits. Thanks for your understanding. So, as I was saying, you believe that your younger sister is missing, has been for roughly 24 hours, and being that she's, I'm only speculating here, young and full of youthful energy and ambition and has the whole entire world out in front of her to explore, you firmly believe that with infinite options presented to her, she has chosen to spend her time hiding in the men's restroom of a highway rest stop between two forgettable cities? The man waited a beat. Are you finished? For now, Lance said. He was being patient, and it was killing him on the inside. Yes, that's exactly what I think. She's here. I know it. And I think the two of you are trying to help her. Help her what? Lance said. You said she's missing not on the run. He knew the truth, at least he thought he understood part of it, but he needed the man to understand that he knew. There's more to it, the man said. She stole something from me. Then, with a hiss in his voice, and I'm not somebody you want to steal from. After this quasi-threat had been delivered, the man's eyes softened a bit, his voice calm again. How much is she paying you? The guy asked, rubbing the stubble on his cheek and looking like he was suddenly unraveling a great mystery. Lance shook his head. I don't know what you're... The man sprang into action, all coiled muscle and anger flying toward Lance. Lance turned in time to have his shoulder absorb the brunt of the impact, but he was still knocked off balance, stumbling a few steps as the man's weight drove him back into the men's room. They hit the wall hard, and one of the automatic paper towel dispensers triggered, spitting out a sheet. The man hunched low on his legs and then drove his weight upward, slamming Lance against the wall, pressing his forearm under Lance's chin, applying pressure on Lance's windpipe. You don't know who I am, the man said, or what I'm capable of. That bitch crossed the line and she needs to pay. I'm giving you the chance to walk away, right now, with all your teeth. All you have to do is tell me where she... There was a dull thud sound and the man's eyes went wide and all the air whooshed out of his lungs and he cried out in pain as his muscles all relaxed and he started to go down. Lance had been full of fear that the man would notice Leah creeping up behind him, had struggled greatly to keep his eyes forward and not glance her direction, giving her away. But she'd made it, and one ferocious kick to the balls was all it took to take the man down. Lance coughed to clear his throat to catch his breath. He looked at Leah and said, Did you play soccer as a kid? Leah smiled and shrugged, but then her eyes fell onto the man writhing in pain on the bathroom floor. Oh, right, Lance said. He reached down and grabbed fistfuls of the man's expensive button-down shirt, hauled him so he was sitting upright, and then slammed him once against the wall. Keeping his grip tight, Lance squatted down and looked the man in the eyes, which were rolling around, seized in agony. Look at me, Lance said. Look at me, or this time she'll punt them clear back to the last exit. The man struggled for only a moment, but one additional slam against the wall knocked all the fight out of him. His eyes met Lance. I know exactly who you are, Lance said. Your name is Paul Anderley. You live at 373 North Cypress Avenue, a big place on the hill, swimming pool in the back and a three-car garage. 
You host an annual barbecue in the summer that's always the talk of the neighborhood. Everyone thinks you're a day trader, that you make your money because of your uncanny ability to time the market. Self-made, the American dream and all that. Lance slammed the guy against the wall again, just because he felt like it. Because the words he was saying, while they would have had the impact needed, didn't seem like enough. Didn't exonerate all the pain this guy had caused. But that's a lie, isn't it, Paul? You're a drug dealer. One of the biggest in the region. You import and distribute and have some very powerful people as clients. People that have entrusted you with their biggest secrets and therefore pay the biggest prices. Lance rattled off a list of names that had been transferred to him, along with all the other information he was revealing to Paul, when he'd caught the man's weak punch after Lance had spun him around as he'd attempted to enter the women's room. One of Lance's instant downloads had always seemed to take him by surprise. At the mention of his clients' names, Paul's eyes grew wider than they'd been when Leah had pulverized his testicles. That's right, Lance said. I know everything. I also know that you have a thing for younger girls. Like to bring them to your big house with your fancy things and watch their mouths drop open in wonder. And then you make them do things. To you, to your friends. And if they don't like it, if they don't bow to the demands of the almighty Paul Anderley, what do you do, Paul? Hmm? Do you hit them? Knock them around and show them who's boss? Degrade them even more? Lance wished he could push the images out of his head, the ones he'd pulled from Paul's own memory. But they were there, front and present, and Lance felt his own anger begin to boil. He slammed Paul against the wall hard enough this time that the man's head cracked against the tile, his eyes going temporarily blank. Lance, Leah said. Lance breathed in deeply, worked to regain his composure. We know all of this, Paul. All of this and more. It's all documented. We have a big colorful PowerPoint and everything. And it's going out to the police, FBI, news outlets, everyone. It's probably already in their inboxes. This girl? And sure, we'll call her Allison. She worked with us to set you up. Get you right here to us. Honestly, I'm just surprised you were actually dumb enough to show up. Paul's face was returning back to normal, either because of the pain subsiding or Lance's words sobering him up. Back was the malice, as he said. I'll kill you, you know that? Both of you. Go ahead, Leah said, coming up beside Lance and squatting down to look the man in the eyes. We're both wearing wireless cameras and mics. Everything's been recorded from well before you got here. The signal is transmitting back to HQ via satellite. Do you really want to add murder to your list of charges, Paul? Paul went quiet, his body going very still as he looked back and forth between them, as if he were struggling to process what was happening. Lance loosened his grip, just enough for the man to notice, which had the desired effect. Paul pushed off the ground like a bottle rocket, knocking both Lance and Leah out of the way. He didn't say a word as he sprinted from the men's room, his footsteps growing quieter in the night as he fled. The sound of the truck's engine roared to life and tires squealed on asphalt, and Paul Anderley was gone as fast as he'd arrived. Are you okay? Lance asked, helping Leah up from the ground. Leah nodded. Fine. She looked at him hard. You let him go? Lance shrugged. What was I going to do? Arrest him? We could have called the police. Lance shook his head, tapped his temple with his index finger. My only evidence is up here. Leah thought for a moment, then nodded her head. She understood. Such was the burden of being Lance Brody. Wireless cameras, Lance asked. Satellite back to HQ? That was a good touch. Leah did a small bow. I thought you'd like that, Mr. Flip Phone. Lance nodded. Now what do we do, she asked. Lance turned and looked at the semi-open door at the back of the men's room. Now we find the girl, he said. Tell me what you saw in the women's room. 10. When Leah had finished explaining to Lance about how there had definitely been a person, she could not verify it was a girl based on the sound of the person's gasp alone, though she'd be willing to bet that it had been a girl, and had in all likelihood been exactly who Paul Anderley had been looking for, in the last stall of the women's room, and then suddenly there hadn't been when she'd gone back to check, Lance asked, Is there a door at the back of the women's room, like that one? He pointed to the one that was a quarter open at the rear of the men's room. Leah nodded. Yes, but it's just a janitor's closet. I checked inside. There was nobody there. Lance thought for a moment. It was open when you went in the first time? Leah tried to recall what she'd seen when she first entered the restroom. 
Yes, I'm positive it was. Lance started walking toward the open door. Leah followed. He said, This one was too. Why are both the janitor's closets open when there's no janitor here and it's the middle of the night? I'm sure protocol is to lock them up, keep folks from stealing things. Maybe they just forgot, Leah said, but she didn't believe it. Lance had been teaching her some interesting things about coincidences. Maybe they could forget to lock one, Lance said, pulling the door wide open and stepping inside, but I doubt they forget to lock both. Leah squeezed into the closet with him, and she was hit with a sudden memory of playing seven minutes in heaven at a middle school party in West Haven when she'd been 14. She'd been goaded into the closet with Chris Gray, the best friend of the guy she'd actually had a crush on. As a result, she'd settled and dated Chris through the summer, as much as 14-year-olds could date, but it was nothing more than both of them trying to chase the excitement they'd felt for those few minutes in that closet and hope it had led to something bigger. Spoiler alert, it hadn't. Lance had turned and was staring at something behind her, back toward the door. Leah turned and followed his gaze and landed on what had interested him. A ladder was mounted just to the left of the door, just narrow enough to fit into the space, just wide enough for a person. They'd both craned their necks up, following to where it led. There was a hatch in the ceiling, a single sliding bolt meant to keep it locked. The bolt was disengaged. She's on the roof, Leah said. 11. Lance told Leah what he wanted to do and then counted to 30 as they'd planned. When he finished counting, he climbed the ladder in the men's room janitor's closet and then reached up and gently opened the hatch, suddenly finding himself looking up at the night sky. I come in peace, he called out, trying to sound non-threatening. But even as he climbed the last few rungs of the ladder and hoisted himself onto the roof, he heard the scrambling of sneakers behind him and the sound of another hatch being thrown open. He stood and turned in time to see a young girl freeze, looking down into the open mouth of the hatch that led into the women's room closet. Hi, Leah's voice floated up from below. I'm Leah. Mind if I come up so we can talk? Oh, and that guy up there with you? That's Lance. He's my boyfriend. He's one of the good ones. Trust me. Lance stood where he was and watched as the girl took a few cautious steps backward, glancing over her shoulder as she did so, as if double-checking to make sure he wasn't going to make a move on her. She reached the middle ground between the two hatches and stopped. Leah's head popped up from the women's room hatch and she pulled herself up. The girl, who looked to be 18 at the absolute most, turned her head back and forth between them, and that was when Lance saw it. Her brown hair fell down around her face, but when she'd shifted her head, she tossed a bit of it out of the way in an effort to see him better, and the moonlight had lit up her features and Lance had seen the bruising around her cheek and eye. Her entire body was poised, ready for action, ready to fight. Her eyes were wide. She looked like a scared animal in a trap, ready to make one last desperation attempt to ward off poachers. Lance stayed where he was, held up his hands. It's okay, he said. He's gone. He's not coming back. He let Leah be the one to move in on the girl, let her slowly take steps closer. The girl jerked when she realized Leah was almost upon her. But then Leah spoke something too soft for Lance to hear, and the girl's entire body seemed to relax, and suddenly she was in Leah's arms, sobbing into the quiet of the night. 12. They sat on the roof together, the three of them. The air was colder up here, the breeze occasionally biting. None of them cared. Lance and Leah listened as the girl told her story. Lance already knew most of it, but how could he explain that? He wouldn't. The girl's name really was Allison, but she wasn't Paul Anderley's sister. She was just one of the girls that had made the unfortunate mistake of thinking he was a nice guy. He'd courted her with expensive dinners and his flashy cars and had then invited her to a party at his house, a chance to meet his friends. Drinks were consumed, drugs were distributed, and Allison quickly saw Paul and his crew for what they really were. Paul had stripped her of her shirt in the middle of a game of billiards, right there in front of everybody. And when she'd protested, all he'd done was laugh and drag her to a back bedroom while his friends had laughed and hollered and cheered him on. In the bedroom, he'd pinned her to the bed and started working on her pants. When she started to fight back, the last thing she remembered seeing was his fist flying toward her face. When she woke up, naked and alone in the back bedroom, she found her clothes scattered around the room and got dressed. Out in the rest of the house, everyone was passed out, splayed across the furniture and the floor like animals sleeping at the zoo. I thought about killing him, Allison said through tears. 
He was passed out on the couch. Another girl asleep with her head in his lap. I could have done anything I wanted to him. Leah shook her head. But that's not your style. Because you're a good person, Lance said. So you just ran away. Allison snorted a laugh and wiped her eyes. I'm not quite that innocent. I stole his car, she said. I knew where he kept the keys to the mall, on these hooks by the door to the garage. So I grabbed the only one I really recognized, the key fob to that one. She nodded toward the front of the building, toward the parking lot where the Tesla sat. And I just drove off. She shook her head. It wasn't until I got here that I found the bag in the back seat. That's when I knew I was in trouble. Bag? Lance asked. He remembered the way Paul Anderley had opened the Tesla's door and looked inside. He was looking for something more than just a person. Allison took a deep breath, then stood. Come on, I'll show you. 13. As Allison climbed the ladder and into the women's room, Lance was hit with a question of something that didn't quite make sense to him yet. He let Leah head down after Allison and then followed, closing the hatch after him. He and Leah followed Allison outside and then around the side of the building, their shoes crunching through the crushed gravel of the path that led to the maintenance shed. Allison stopped in front of it, pulled a small key ring from the pocket of her jeans, and Lance thought he now had his question answered. That's why you came here, he said. Allison looked up at him. What? I couldn't figure out why you'd stop here of all places, in the middle of the night. You work here, right? Allison shook her head. Not me. Not really. My dad. He worked for the state. Takes care of this place and others like it. She shrugged. I help sometimes, when he's not feeling well or is just beat from a busy day. He made me a set of keys a long time ago. Because you're a good person, Lance thought again. A few miles down the road, after I'd stolen the car, I guess I had a bit of a panic attack. All the emotions just sort of hit me, you know? The the party and then me coming in Grand Theft Auto. She gave a soft, sad laugh. It was like I was dreaming. But then it suddenly got hard to breathe and my heart started racing and... I know this place. I'm comfortable here. It was like a piece of my normal life. Lance and Leah said nothing. I have no idea how he found me so fast, Allison said. How could he possibly know to come here? He met me at my real job, bagging groceries at the Whole Foods. I never told him about my dad. He never asked many questions about me, not really. Leah had the answer. The Tesla, she said. He tracked it from his phone. It's part of the car's app. He was always going to know where you were as long as you were with it. Allison sighed and shook her head. I hate technology. Lance smiled. Me too. Allison slid a small key into the lock of the maintenance shed's door and turned it. There was a satisfying click as the lock disengaged and she swung the door open enough to reach inside with both hands. I stashed this in here as soon as I realized what it was, she said. I figured it was the safest place. She struggled to pull out a duffel bag that looked as though it were weighted down with bricks. She let the bag fall to the ground and then reached down and unzipped it. It was full of cash. Bricks made of bills, not rock. Smaller denominations, tens and twenties. Allison stood back and looked at Lance and Leah, as if waiting for some sort of answer. That's a lot of money, Lance said. Thousands, Leah added. What am I supposed to do with it now? Allison asked. Then all eyes fell to Lance. He thought for a moment, then looked at Allison and smiled. Whatever you want. I don't think Paul's going to come looking for it anymore. Maybe take your dad on a vacation. He'd probably like that, right? When nobody said anything, Lance turned around and started walking down the path, back toward the front of the building. Sorry, he said. I really have to pee. 14. Leah drove the Beetle down the highway, Lance next to her and Allison in the back. The duffel bag of cash was sitting next to Allison in the seat. They followed Allison's directions, took an exit ramp 20 miles from the rest area, and then navigated the suburban streets through a neighborhood of modest housing until Allison finally said, That one, with the blue mailbox. Leah nodded and pulled into the driveway, parking behind a dirty white Toyota Camry. Allison thanked them profusely and offered them cash from the bag. They declined repeatedly until she was finally convinced. She slung the bag over her shoulder and stepped out of the car. It was just shy of four in the morning. 
Lance watched as she walked up to the front door of the house and then slipped inside. How is she going to explain all that money to her dad, Leah asked. Lance shrugged. No idea. Maybe she'll just tell the truth. Sometimes things just have a way of working out. Besides, he said, reaching over and squeezing her hand, we've done our part. Then, well, almost. They drove back through the neighborhood and into the business district, where they found the bus station sitting adjacent to the railroad tracks. Lance stepped out of the Beetle and went inside, found the bank of payphones near the back and placed a call to 911. He gave the person on the other end of the line all the information they needed to have cause for investigation into Paul Anderley and his home. He kept Allison's name out of it, as well as his own. When the 911 operator started asking for more specifics, Lance hung up the phone. 15. The sun was coming up on the horizon and Leah flipped down the sun visor as she drove. Lance was once again leaned back in his seat, his legs stretched out. They'd stopped at a drive through before leaving town, and the inside of the Beetle now smelled of breakfast sandwiches and coffee. It was wonderful. Leah sipped her coffee and said, Well, I guess that was easier than wrestling with the devil, huh? He knew she'd meant it as a joke, perhaps trying to deal with her own emotions about everything that had just happened, but he answered honestly. There's lots of types of devils, he said, sipping from his own large coffee cup. That's the problem. This has been Dark Rest, a Lance Brody story. Written by Michael Robertson Jr. Narrated by Michael Robertson Jr. Copyright 2020, Michael Robertson Jr. Production copyright 2020 by Michael Robertson Jr.